Welcome back to episode 17 of the Bible Connection podcast. This is a weekly podcast, and it follows our church's Bible reading plan that we might encourage you to not give up on reading your Bibles this year. So I'm your host, Josh Williams, and with me some of our, are some of my good friends, Taylor Babcock. Hello. Brandon Stukesbury. Hello. And John Steinke. Hey there. So this week, we are discussing all of Second Kings, okay? So the Book of Kings, it was originally one text, but our Bibles have divided into two parts for the reader. Now we're going over part two. So let's hop into it. All right, one of the last things we discussed in our previous episode on First Kings was God's purposes being worked out through his prophet Elijah. As we turn the pages uh, into Second Kings, we see his, his successor, Elisha. So what is, what is the purpose of this transition slash relationship between these two prophets? I see a couple purposes in their relationship. Um, the first one is structural to the text, and another one is picked up on through the New Testament. So when we were talking about the book of Kings last week, I told you to pay attention to when it says whether they did evil or right in the eyes of the Lord, and that this is the way that the people of Israel were being judged, not the people, the kings of Israel were being judged in God's eyes. And we drew connection to that where Solomon asked that he could discern from right and wrong, and that the wisdom he was given was a distinguishing between right and wrong. Well, as we get into Second Kings, um, we see that the people are definitely still doing evil in the sight of the Lord. But there's another phrase that's been used that I think becomes more prevalent in the second half of the text, and that is, if he did like his father before him. And when you look at Elisha, and as he passes the mantle off to Elisha, you see some language that I think has got some strong paternal connections, right? Three times in chapter 2, he says, you should stay back, I'm about to be taken. And he says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And so Elisha is modeling for us and for the readers this, this picture of what you should do when you see a man doing right in the eyes of the Lord. You should cling close to him and you should insist on... Um, and, and, and being like him, to, to be close to him. He, he asks for a double portion of what the Lord did for Elijah um, to be done in his life. And so I think that is the right model of what these kings should be doing with their, with their fathers when their fathers are doing right in the eyes of the Lord. The second connection I think that's important with this transition is this imagery of, okay, so Elijah takes Elisha. He, he strikes the, the Jordan River with his coat, it parts for him. They walk out of the promised land. Elijah is taken up, and Elisha takes his coat and strikes the river and comes back full. And so I think there's rich imagery here to show that this is both like an exodus motif, that like we said with um, Naomi leaving the land empty and coming back full, um, and as we saw with the Israelites doing that. But I also think there's a strong connection between this idea of passing um, the mantle in ministry. We see Moses uh, was succeeded by Joshua, marked by the um, death of Moses and when he crossed the Red Sea. And we also see some connections um, between John the Baptist and Christ. Now, that might have sounded a little weird. It sounded a little weird for me when I first heard it. It, it makes sense that Elijah is connected to John the Baptist, right? We see that in the text. Jesus explicitly discusses that with his disciples. But um, I, I think, as I read through Second Kings, and I, I think you all see it too, that Elisha is a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. If you look at the miracles of Elisha, you see him um, you know, opening the eyes of the blind, feeding people miraculously with a limited amount of food. The dead are being raised. He's, he's assisting the poor. And, and there's connection to how Christ did that in his ministry. And to put, to put textual data to what you're saying, <clears throat> you can see the call of Elisha in, back in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18, and, and, and what, he's, what Kings is saying here should sound very familiar to Jesus calling his disciples. What is Elisha, what is Elisha doing when Elijah calls him? He's plowing with, with oxen, right? And he Elijah passes by, throws his coat, his cloak on him. This is his the the symbol, of the mantle of his prophethood or whatever. And I th I think it's kind of interesting. Cody Gideon po po uh, pointed this out to me one time. That it's kind of funny. I don't know that it's meant to be funny, but 
when when Elijah does this to Elisha, Elisha's response is, "Go back again for what have I done to you?" Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like I I didn't want this. You know, it's kind of mm-hmm. kind of like, but but the the imagery here sounds very similar to to Jesus's uh, ministry, but. If you look, if you look at going going back to First Kings chapter one, what does Elijah look like? If you look at First Kings chapter one verse eight, the second the second in in chapter in in chapter one verse eight, it says, "What kind of man is this who comes to meet you and has told you these things?" And this is describing Elijah. They answered him, "He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite.'" So. John the Baptist is described as as wearing a a, a, a garment of hair. Uh, it says he's eating locusts and wild honey. You know, you, you look at what Elijah is saying. He's pretty fiery. Taylor brought that up last time. Uh, John the Baptist is pretty fiery. He says, you know, the people who are coming down to be baptized, uh, he calls them brood of brood of vipers. Who warned you? <laughs> yeah, who warned you to? to yeah, yeah, that's an interesting strategy for a Sunday morning. People, visitors coming in. Now, who told you you're supposed to come here this morning? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He tells them basically their, their their father's the devil, which I'm sure made them really excited about. Uh, I'm sure they loved it. Yeah, yeah. But but so many there's there's so many parallels to this. But but the one the one that was the most striking to me is you read about this in the Gospels in in Matthew chapter 11. John the Baptist is imprisoned, and John the Baptist sends messengers to Jesus. Basically, he he's wondering what is going on. Why why is why is Rome not being overthrown? They're they're you know he's he's in a he's in a bad place, and he he asks his uh, he asks his his disciples to basically go question Jesus and say, "Are you the one that's coming, or should we look for another?" Well, what does Jesus tell tell these messengers to tell John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, verse four, it says, and Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and what you see. Go tell John, um, uh, go tell uh, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear the dead are raised. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. If you look at, if you, if you look at Elijah's, Elijah's, ministry it's 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 there are there are seven sets of there are seven miracles that happen in in Elijah's ministry and they're you know you know fire coming down you know big big stuff but if you look at the miracles in Elisha's ministry it's you know a widow a widow she's she's basically gone broke and she's gonna have her son is gonna have to go into slavery Elijah Elisha you know, is, is performing this miracle where, you know, oil is, 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 is flows, right. And she's able to, she's able to pay off her debts and, and, and provide for her family. Um, the, the sons of the prophets, they are starving to death, right. And they're eating soup, you know, gourd soup, which is, uh, sounds absolutely, you know, fantastic. (laughs) Like grandma's cooking. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds, but it's enough to keep them alive, right. But they are, there's, you know, one grabs the poison gourd or whatever, and Elisha throws some flour in it, and it it heals the heals the soup because they're he's keeping them from starving to death. I mean, just basically like small household type miracles. I, I, they're the the sons of the prophets need a a bigger place to live, so they go out and they're you know you know cutting timber. Axe head falls in the water. Elisha throws a stick in the water and floats the axe head up. I mean, just little stuff like that. And you see, this is this Jesus. If you look at Jesus's miracles, they're, they're very isolated. And, and lots of times Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this, you know, don't, you know, and that's, it's, it's very similar to, um, to what we see here in second Kings. Elijah and Elisha. Does anybody else have difficulty in saying those two when you're saying them together? Like they sound <laughs> so close. I know. Uh, it sounded like you just said the same name twice. I, I, I might have. 
<laughs> but um, I think just to kind of get around that and pretty say good, no, pretty Elijah, good chance we're going to goof up on it before this podcast. Oh, I'm is sure. Over. I, I probably did say it twice, but Elijah. I think in Hebrew you can say Elia because the J is more of a Y sound. Mm-hmm. So maybe we could say Elia and Elisha. But that I don't want to be accused off. of cultural appropriation. I'm really going to goof yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know, but like uh, Brandon and John were saying, uh, there's there, there's so many parallels between. Uh, Eliah and Elisha. Uh, and we see that with Moses and Joshua. Um, and j- just a few examples, Elijah, like I think it was mentioned before, like Moses parts the water um, and they both walk over on dry ground. Elijah builds an altar with 12 stones. Moses constructs an altar uh, with 12 pillars. Uh, you see these parallels. Uh, Moses, Joshua, Eliah or Elijah, and Elisha and then we see John the Baptist and Jesus. Um, so going back to Moses and um, Joshua, what is the name Joshua? It's Yeshua, or the same name that Jesus has. So once it's good, more, it's a good name. you can you can um, <laughs> um, parallel uh, and see how there is this discipleship pattern um, that continues through uh, the scriptures until the time that we get to uh, to Jesus. Um, so, and, and, and Joshua I'll, and beyond. Yeah, I'll, I'll argue and, beyond because and, Paul Paul has disciples. Yes, and, Timothy, and beyond. Timothy, Titus, yeah. Um, to the New Testament and beyond. That's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> buckle up. There's a snake under my boot. <laughs> <laughs> but I forgot what I was going to say after that. Oh, no. um, and and I, I think Moses and Elijah had no tomb. In uh, you, you see the, the the parallels in the, the prefigure in, in that, that being passed down. So as we get into Kings. We see that there is not the same pattern uh, that is being uh, always followed out the way that it should be, Great as point. is testim- or as is demonstrated with Elijah and Elisha, um, in how that model of discipleship is passed on, or the torch is passed on to the next. Um, we don't see that from king to king, um, and there's a lot of hiccups. We should, and, a lot, and we should, um, but as we read through uh, Kings, there are twenty. Israelite, uh, or 20 kings of Israel, and then there are 20 kings of Judah, the two kingdoms. All 20 of the Israel kings are bad. Um, I think eight out of the out of the 20 in Judah are good. 12 of them are bad. So there's a lot of bad kings, and a lot of that is a result of not having uh, a faithful generation pass um, the faith on to the next generation. All right, Rolling into the next question. So one, one of the things we, we remarked upon last week was how the kings of Israel and Judah were judged based on whether they did right or evil in the eyes of the Lord. So, so what are we to make of both Israel and Judah having wicked kings like Ahab in chapter 8? And, and why does Elisha order Jehu to be anointed king over Israel? Well, this actually picks right up on where Taylor was talking about, how we have these wicked kings from Israel and these wicked kings now in the line of Judah becoming apparent. I mean, we have here in chapter 8, Jehoram, right? Um, he marries the daughter of Ahab, which is, you know, why would you do that? Mm-hmm. Well, because his father, Jehoshaphat, was buddies with Ahab and was always going out to battle with him, and he, he probably wanted her. And so this, this is becoming a decline where the Lord is ready to judge the sins of, of these wicked kings and the people that have been abandoning him, um, over and over again. Um, he says in chapter 8, verse 19, he's not willing to destroy Judah yet for the sake of David because he promised to give a lamp to him and his sons forever. But when Jehu is anointed, he's anointed explicitly the purpose of cutting off the kingdom uh, from the lineage of Ahab and to judge Jezebel for her wickedness. And that's explicitly what he does. If you start reading through chapter 9 and 10, he goes out, he goes and he executes them. He, he, he kills them. He cuts off that line um, and as he establishes himself of, as king of Israel, this is his chance. Is he going to do better than them? Well, no. In chapter 10, verse 28, Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, where he made Israel to sin with the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. And I want you to pay attention to that when you read through Second Kings, because this indictment is on every one of the kings of Israel. Every single one of them are still going to worship those golden calves that are on the peak of those mountains in Bethel and Dan as they do evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's bringing judgment on the land. Yeah. Can I, can I back us up? I'm sorry. I meant, I meant to add this at the first part. But in, in, especially in Second Kings, we see this kind of parallel narratives. 
you have the 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 narratives of beginning very 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 quickly uh, early in Second Kings with Elijah, then Elisha, and then after Elisha, you have the sons of the prophets, and then towards the end of of Second Kings, you have uh, you have um, 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 Isaiah, who's in the in the life of. But but anyway, but before we get there. There's a couple things I would I would want to point us out, and and this this the the prophets are weaved are weaved in in between the king's narrative, but before we get to there's a there's a really strange story that happens with Elisha in chapter two, and and there have there I have read <laughs> that some have used this this text to basically criticize Christianity and say this is the, or the scriptures and say this is just this is just stupid. This this strange uh, section in Second Kings chapter two, uh, verse starting verse uh, twenty three, and it went up there um, there to Bethel. Um, there going up on on the way, the ESV translates it as some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, "Go up, you bald head! Go up, you bald head!" And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she bears came out of the woods and tore forty two of them uh, of the boys. Um, from there, he went to Mount Carmel and returned to Samaria. So, in this in this text here, um, there 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 may be, I, I I hate to criticize the translation, but it does seem like the, there there may be a better translation here of Yeladim, in where it says some small boys. It's probably priests. What's happening is the these these false priests these and they may be young. They may be you know just 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 you know, the false the, the false religion. You know that these these priests are coming up and mocking the prophet of the Lord, right? And and the the Lord sends judgment through through um, Elijah. But in this in in chapter five, I, I would if you have if you have the uh, Jesus Storybook Bible for children, I don't know that 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 this this chapter could be explained any better than what. Is explain a children's book, right? Biblical theology from a children's book. It's fantastic, but this 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 section in, in chapter five, where Naaman, this 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 uh, great man from Syria, right? This man comes in, you know, steals basically steals this young girl from the land of Israel, right? But Naaman is a, is a leper. Or, or has some sort of skin disease, right? And she tells Naaman about the prophet Elisha, right? And Naaman come, and this this story is picked up on the, in the New Testament. But she, she 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 may, for all we know, I mean, they're they're we have no idea of of what happened to this girl. But she cares enough about Naaman, and she's she's reflecting on God's. God's heart for the nations, even though this man has probably done some sur- this massively wicked stuff, she cares enough about this man and the nations to tell this Gentile that there's there's a prophet in Israel that can heal you, right? And we see, I think that the, this is put in the in the narrative of Kings section the, the, the section here to 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 help us. Um, see this. So Naaman comes to Elisha. Elisha doesn't even go out to meet him. I think this is picked up on Jesus not even having to go to a man comes to Jesus wanting Jesus to heal the man's uh, child. Jesus doesn't even have to go. He just says your son's healed um, and and does that. Uh, Elisha is doing kind of the same thing here. Um, Elisha tries to pay him. Um, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Naaman tries to, well, what, what, what Elisha tells Naaman to do is, I mean, it's silly. Let's be honest with you. It's, it's, it's pretty silly. And Naaman himself recognizes that it's silly, but in faith, you know, humbling himself, he goes and washes himself, dips himself in, um, the Jordan river. But what happens after this is, is, is stunning. In Second Kings chapter five, verse sixteen through nineteen, um, Naaman basically there's a conversion. Naaman rejects the false religion of Syria and and becomes and, and is engrafted just like just like 
Rahab, just like Ruth, just like, I mean, there's, there's sprinkled throughout the text God's heart for the nations that, that within the tree of Israel, that he is grafting in wild olive shoots into the into this tree and that that happens here naaman becomes you know becomes a follower of yahweh and this is where kind of where we the new testament picks up on god fearers who are gentiles who who are who believe in yahweh and are following um uh, torah so um it, it, it's it's with, without going into it, he he even takes dirt from 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 Israel and takes it back with him because he says he's going to offer sacrifices. He's going to build an altar and offer sacrifices to Yahweh instead of the gods of Syria. So anyway, fantastic passage. But I'm sorry, I had to go back to that. Oh, you're good. So uh, rolling into the next one in the middle of chap in in the middle chapters of Second Kings, many of the kings in Judah begin to do right in the eyes of the Lord, but in Israel. There's wicked king after wicked king without a single righteous among them. So so what is the ultimate result of this continual sin in Israel, and, and what are we supposed to learn from it? In a historical sense, the result is going to be the destruction and the exile of the people of the northern kingdom. Um, Assyria comes in and destroys their strongholds and destroys their cities and destroys um, their their armies and takes the men into exile and Israel is blotted out from the land. But I, w- I want to draw your attention to both why and and what's happening. So when you look at the um, continual sin of each king of Israel, you only get like little paragraphs that describes what they've been doing. But these paragraphs are painting for you a really sad picture. Brandon just described how. Um, this man, this foreign man who's done God knows what in his pagan rituals has been grafted into the family. And he talks about how Rahab has done this and Ruth has done this. Well, Israel is consistently trying to graft itself out and become more like Egypt. Since the days of their fathers in the wilderness, they've wanted to go back to the land of Egypt. And the first king of Israel, when this northern king was established, he he built these idols and put them up on these two mountains of Dan and Bethel and he said behold your gods which saved you out of the land of Egypt he's he's beginning from Sinai where where the golden calf was deconstructing their faith in Yahweh to the point when you get to the beginning of second kings you have Elijah interacting with this king who's he, he's indicting him he's he's punishing him for saying like is there no Lord at all? In, is there no Yahweh in Israel that you have to pray to this Baalzebub in order to be healed? And as you go through every one of these kings, it says they followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them. They did evil in the sight of the Lord over and over again. You see this with Jeroboam the second, Zechariah. You see this with Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah. Um, and even uh, all the way down to Hosea, what's interesting is, um, you know, borrow that language from Brandon. Here's the interesting thing. When, when we look at the way that they finally fall to Assyria, he's going on his hands and knees to Egypt, and he's trying to bribe them into becoming a vassal of Egypt rather than fall to Assyria. He's not turning to the Lord like Ahab. He's not turning and repenting that the Lord might spare him. Instead, he's, he's trying to bribe So, the king of Egypt, and that's when Assyria finally blots them out, when they've when they finally sold their hearts and their and their minds back to wanting to be slaves to Egypt, then they're no longer a part of the the faithful who entered into the promised land. I mean, I would, I would remind you of the book of Hebrews. You know, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as those who did in the wilderness. And who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt with Moses? And with whom was he provoked for, for, for 40 years? It was those whose bodies fell in the wilderness. These people are just like those fathers in the wilderness. They would rather eat the cucumbers and garlic of Egypt than to, to, than to be a part of, of the kingdom of Yahweh. So the Lord has blotted them out for their sin. All right, rolling to the next one. So throughout First and Second Kings, there have been over 40 kings in Israel and Judah. After the fall of Israel, we have a mixed bag of Omi- o- obedient, <laughs> obedient and idolatrous kings in Judah. How can I keep track of all these kings, and, and what are we supposed to take away from the history of Judah in these days? So a visual, just this is really simple, um, but a visual thing that I have done, and I, I don't, I, John and Taylor have way better stuff, but this is just really simple. 
is in in the narrative of the the, the actual king narrative here. I would I would under underline the king's name, and then underline is this a king of Judah or is this a king of Israel, right? And then afterwards, it'll I would underline does this king do what is right in the eyes of the Lord or does he do what is evil in the eyes of the Lord? And for me, that's a visual thing in my Bible that helps me. And 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 before this, it tells you this king of Judah came to the throne on this year of this king of is of of Israel, so it's 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 if you if you can actually see that it helps. So, but anyway, John discuss. Oh, um, I I kind of even go a little simpler. I mean, I did, um, you know, just because I was doing some silly songs with some kids and kids you a while back, memorize the kings of Israel and Judah. That never helped me. I'm not going to say like you need to memorize every single one of the kings of Israel and Judah. It's never helped me interpret the passage or understand the flow. What really helped me was every one of the kings of Israel were always evil on the side of the Lord. So I just track the kings of Judah. I, I literally just, I do what Brandon said, but when I go through the kings of Judah, I highlight with a colored pencil, you know, their, their name and whether they did evil or right in the, in the eyes of the Lord. Because my headings above each little section say if king in Israel or king in Judah. And if I see king in Israel, I know, okay, they did evil on the side of the Lord. They were following like Jeroboam. And that's always helped me to keep it straight if I'm getting confused. So I don't know if this is any help, but I like maps a lot. And I like looking visually at the northern map and just seeing uh, Dan to, to that's where the high place was. And then there's there's Samaria. That's their capital that, that they had. And like you can kind of visually see where some of these places where the uh, kings of Israel were and where these events were happening and uh, the wrongdoings that were happening there. But kind of like what John was saying, I've just always in my mind. Every one of the kings of Israel were bad. So, therefore, just kind of looking at the kings of Judah, which ones were good, which ones were bad, um, and kind of follow that chronology. One more thing that helped me out, I, I found a table, um, and I went through, just took 10 minutes once to go through my, my Bible. And a lot of these kings have two names, which can be really confusing. So, everywhere they have two names, I just write both names down so I don't get confused. Like, Uzziah is also known as Azariah. And we know Uzziah from Isaiah, right? In the year King Uzziah died, you know, I went to the Lord. That's also Azariah. And then here at the end of, of Kings, uh, Jehoiakim, that's also Je- uh, Jeconiah. He's, you can pronounce it different ways in, depending on the way it's written. And Jeconiah is the one that's in Matthew chapter 1 where it's the lineage of, of you know, Jesus. So it, it just helps if you just find a good table or a chart and just take some time to write that down because I'm never going to be able to fully memorize every name in the Bible. And it just some notes in your Bible, right in your Bible. It's a really helpful thing to keep track of it. Tattoo it to your left arm. It, you, you would never <laughs> um, but the second part of your question was also like, what are we supposed to learn from it? And that was actually like the thing I really wanted to laser in on as we talked about second Kings. Um, what I would say you're supposed to learn from the, the, the successes and the failures of all these um, Kings. Ultimately Judah is also going to spoiler for the next question. They're also going to be sent to exile. They're also going to face God's judgment. Um, too little, too late with a lot of the repentance. They're, they're continually sinning before the Lord. And I, I think that the message you should be taking away from Second Kings, not that there's a single message to take away from any book of the Bible, but what, what I would emphasize for you is the failure of the fatherhood between each of these kings. Um, we've seen that these fathers are called to, um, you know, Deuteronomy 6, you know, teach the to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength diligently to their children as they rise up and as they lie down and as they go and as they sit. And it's supposed to be on the forefronts of their home and on their wrists and between their eyes. But when I look at these fathers, these kings, I see continual failure to teach to love the Lord. And each generation of the kings of Judah are getting worse and worse off because of it. David gave vindictive advice to Solomon on his deathbed and set a horrible example of discipline for his sons, which divided his kingdom. Solomon failed to pass on his wisdom to Rehoboam, which he despised the wisdom and split the kingdom. Asa failed to take down the high places and made a covenant with wicked Syrians. Jehoshaphat was friends with Ahab and allowed his son to marry Ahab's daughter. Joash was raised without a father and without any of that influence from him that he could have used to serve the Lord with righteousness. Amaziah sought a wife from Israel and lost all the treasures of the temple. Azariah sinned and was struck with leprosy, effectively separating him from his son for the rest of his days. Ahaz burned his son alive. Hezekiah straight up, he's supposed to be a righteous king, straight up says, I don't even care if the kingdom is destroyed in my son's days, as long as it's not happening in my day. 
Manessa burns his son alive, hires witches and necromancers in the land, raises up all of these high places and places for idolatry in the land. So by the time you get to Josiah, like he's an eight-year-old boy with no father figure in his life, with a legacy of corruption and sin, and and it's too little, too late. He repents and he's he does he does great things in the land of Israel, in the land of Judah. Now you know he he does great things, but I would see this decline and this failure of of the kingdom of Judah as an indictment against fathers. Um, these these men should have been righteously serving, but they should have also been righteously raising up families that would be faithful in the next generation. If we read the stories of each individual king, but then we step back and read them all as a meta narrative, you can, uh, Israel, they're all bad, but they continually get worse. But with Judah, they go back and forth a little bit, but overall they get worse and worse. By the time you get to Manasseh, uh, in uh, chapter 21, it says Manasseh led them astray so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. They're worse than the people that were there even before them. So like you see their faith, which dwindles back and forth from generation to generation. But it, 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 at the end of this, with right before Babylon comes in, um, their faith is uh, like just worse on before all of this started. So um, there are some high points though. And I, I want to I want to uh, focus on this one. So Hezekiah is praying, and he says uh, in chapter, I forget what it is, uh, Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you you alone, Lord, are God. Um, this is the same thing that, I'm paraphrasing, what David says before Goliath, that the nations of the earth may know who God is. And I, I think that's the commission. That's what has been told to the Israelites back in Exodus chapter 19, that they are to display to the world um, and be a, a priestly kingdom. Um, and then right here, Hezekiah has that, even though there are many wicked generations before him and their, their nation split and there's, there's this teetering of faith, um, there is glimpses of faith that is displayed here. Um, and we see that that commission is carried out here. And although shortly after it, Manasseh, his son, is the wicked, the wickedest out of all of them, uh, we do see that there are times in which um, this story and chronology is carried on in a faithful way at times. Yeah, quickly, I, I would I would point out in the kind of the apex of uh, Manasseh's uh, sin here is in chapter twenty one, verse four second half it said in jerusalem or well um uh, and he built altars in the house of of yahweh to which he had said in jerusalem i will put my name um he built altars um for all the host of heaven and i will put my name yahweh had said he was going to put his name on on jerusalem and on his people manasseh says i want to put my name um, and then if you follow out, uh, the Lord makes his name go before people. He puts his name, uh, this this name, name theology. If, if you read throughout the rest of the Tanakh, the, the, the Lord using, saying, I will put my name, my name will go before. It's very interesting. And it culminates in the New Testament where we are baptized into the name of the Father, Son. So, you know, it. It's 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 really interesting um, that how it plays out. Mm-hmm. All right, ending us out. So in the end, Judah is defeated by Nebuchadnezzar and the in, in the king of Babylon. So so not and the king of Babylon, but Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. So what what did this mean for the people in their day, and and how does it apply to us? The people in their day was absolutely devastating. I mean, they were. Utterly just defeated. The the people that stayed at their ground and fought were carried away and, and killed summarily. Um, the, the best and the brightest and all of the wisest were carried out of the land. The temple of the Lord was burned to the ground. Um, the, the hope for the, the, the Messiah, the anointed one, was being stripped in front of them as the descendants of the kings were taken away and being made into eunuchs. That should terrify these people who all of their hope is in this coming descendant, you know. I mean, they're, they're still practicing circumcision, looking for the day when the when the holy offspring will come and and will be able to 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 bring them back into the garden. But the temple's been destroyed. It, for for the people of of Judah, it was a nightmare. 
But for us, I want to draw your attention to Jeconiah. Jeconiah was one of the descendants of David. It says Jehoiachin in your um, Bibles in chapter 24, um, but it's just another way of um, writing his name. Um, Jehoiachin was 11 years old when he became king, reigned for 13, uh, uh, reigned for three months, uh, 18 years old. I don't know why I said 11. 18 years old, reigned for three months. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, but when he's carried away into the land, um, he is, if you look at chapter 25, we mentioned this, I think, last week in our the last podcast. Two verses. Um, he, he's, he's brought out in the 37th year of exile of Jehoiachin, um, the king. He's brought out um, from prison. He's dressed graciously freed, and he's spoken to kindly. He sat with the king, and he's able to dine at the king's table, and a regular allowance was given to him for his daily needs. And we see in the book of Matthew, um, chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, that this is where we have the lineage of Jesus. While, while, God, while God did judge Judah for their sin, and he no longer tolerated these, these wicked pretenders, these non-servant kings that refused to tend and keep his, his, tap, his temple, um, he, he, he blotted them out from the land. He did not forget his promise to Abraham. He did not forget his promise to David. He didn't forget his promise to Eve. He is still going to faithfully raise up his son. Um, and so that glimmer of hope is there for us. Yeah, and what you said is the main point of this. Um, but secondarily to this passage, this, this should sound eerily familiar um, because in David's in David's day, David preserved Mephibosheth, and the language that's used in Second Kings here, these last two verses, is basically word for word what David did. David showed kindness and love. He showed Hemet and 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 uh, and and, and Hesed to Mephibosheth. Basically, you know, he was this, you know. He was the last Saul odd, you know, person who could who could who could take the the the, the, the throne, but David showed fe- you know love to this Mephibosheth, and the Lord now is doing the same thing that David kind of did, and he's preserving um, Jehoiachin here. Um, so the, the the language is 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 amazing. You know, I'd be interested to trace it out chrono- chronologically. Um, Jehoiachin is not released from prison right as the temple's destroyed or as the first exiles were taken away, it's very possible that the first wave of exiles that left with uh, Jerusalem when it was first defeated included this young boy named Daniel. And Daniel had interactions with Nebuchadnezzar that humbled him and brought him to trust in the Lord. And it's very possible that God was using Daniel to be the preservation for this Jeconiah and bring him to the king's table and to teach him about Mephibosheth even directly. Um, So, no, I'm not... I haven't traced all that out chronologically perfectly, but I, I'm, I am certain that the exiles were taken before all of these events happened, and there was plenty of time for that interaction to have occurred. Can't wait to get into Daniel. How about you guys? <laughs> so, all right. I want to say thank you guys for joining us on week 17. Um, and I just wanted to say, just remember, you know, you can ask questions. Uh, we have a couple options for that. Uh, we, we have an email. Uh, it's it's the Bible Connection BDBC at gmail.com. Uh, or you can just simply leave a comment here on YouTube. Uh, and then, like I say every week, just reach out to us if you got our number, if you see us in church. Just however you think you can get a hold of us. We, we would love to hear your questions. But that's it for the episode, and we'll see you on uh, episode 18. <laughs>